Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on synaptic mechanisms. In this video, we're going to discuss uh, how the botulinum toxins work. Okay, so botulinum toxins are toxins released by a uh, bacterial uh, species known as Clostridium botulinum, spelt like this. Um, and uh, they are one of some of the most toxic chemicals known to man, basically. I think, in fact, one of them is the most toxic substance that is known to man, uh, i.e. the dose that is needed to kill you is the lowest of any chemical known. Um, so, uh, they are very, very powerful chemicals, and uh, they there are cases of people where they have ingested these, and they get a um, a disease, well, an illness or a disease known as botulism, uh, which can be fatal. It can cause respiratory paralysis, and we'll see why. Uh, botulinum neurotoxins are used um, both cosmetically and um, for other clinical work, um, and they are infamously known as Botox in short. That's what the um, general public knows of them. Bos meet from botulinum and tox for toxin, basically. So let me just underline that. So, the structure of this video then, what we're going to do is we're firstly going to have a revision of the snares and how we uh, fuse uh, neurosynaptic vesicle membranes with the plasma membrane of axon terminals and how that important that is for neurotransmission. We're then going to have a brief discussion of the bacterial species Clostridium botulinum and uh, how it releases, well not how it releases the toxin, but how the toxin gets into neurons and then what it does once it's in the neurons, which snares it cleaves and then how that leads to botulism and how it can lead to death. Right. Okay, so let's begin by uh, discussing the snares then. So, in order for, um, s uh, for neurotransmission to occur, if I draw an axon terminal here, so this is an axon terminal, in order for an action potential propagating along this neuron to be communicated to, let's say, some postsynaptic neuron here, what we need to do is release neurotransmitter onto this postsynaptic neuron here. Now, snare proteins are extremely important in the release of neurotransmitter from uh, the presynaptic neuron onto the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so let's say we have a vesicle here that is full of neurotransmitter. So I'll draw the neurotransmitter in pink here. What we're going to discuss is how we dock this, neuro, uh, this synaptic vesicle onto our presynaptic membrane so that it's readily uh, releasable when an action potential comes along. And then we're going to discuss when an action potential comes along, how is this uh, vesicle actually released, basically. Okay, so let's begin with the process of how we actually dock the vesicle onto this, as it's known as, the active zone membrane. Okay, so this is the active zone. So, we want to work, know how are we going to actually attach this um, synaptic vesicle onto uh, this membrane of the presynaptic neuron. Okay, so let's draw the synaptic vesicle larger and see how this works. So basically there are proteins in the synaptic vesicle membrane which have to bind to proteins on the plasma membrane. Okay, and these proteins are known as snares for SNAP receptors. Now, there are two main types of snares. There are snare proteins which are on the, on the plasma membrane, so-called T-snares, for target snares, um, because the plasma membrane is viewed as being the target membrane for the fusion of the vesicle. So these are the target snares here. Okay, And uh, there are also snare proteins in the vesicle, and basically what's going to happen is they're going to fuse together to make a core snare complex. So the snares on the vesicle are then known as V-snares, okay, which stands for vesicular snares. So these are equal to the vesicular snares. Right, okay, so let's actually have a look at what proteins are the V-snares and the T-snares. So what actually are the V-snares and T-snares? Well, in the synaptic vesicle, you have a protein known as synaptobrevin 2. Okay, so this is, this is supposed to represent synaptobrevin 
Brevin 2. Whoops, uh, got a little um, squash towards the end there, but never mind. So this is supposed to represent Synaptor Brevin 2, and it's in orange here. Okay, and basically what Synaptor Brevin has is it has a portion that anchors it in the membrane of the vesicle, and then coming out here, it has an alpha helix, which is going to interact with alpha helix helices on the other T snares, basically. Now, this is the V snare that is going to form uh, a complex with the snares on the plasma membrane, these so-called T snares. And I just should just label this up as the plasma membrane down here. Right, so what are the T snares? What are these proteins that are in the membrane of the well are in the plasma membrane? Well one of them is syntaxin one. So I'll do syntaxin one in blue here. So in blue is syntaxin one. So this protein is Sin taxin one. Okay, and then finally, there's another T snare uh, which provides two alpha helices. So syntaxin one has a very similar structure to synaptic brevin. It has a membrane anchoring portion and then a um, alpha helix which is going to interact and form the core snare complex. Okay, so then uh, what we have is um, another T snare known as. SNAP25, which provides two alpha helices, like so. So, let me colour in SNAP25 in red. Okay, so it provides these two alpha helices, and its structure, it has this sort of membrane attachment portion down here, and then it has these two alpha helices which are contributing to the snare complex over here. So this protein is SNAP25. Okay, now, uh, what's going to happen is that um, initially, in the plasma membrane, syntaxin 1 is going to form a uh, complex with SNAP25. So the two, uh, well, these three parallel alpha helices are going to bind together and intertwine. So you have this complex of syntaxin 1 with SNAP25. As the synaptic vesicle, and I should have put some neurotransmitter in here to demonstrate that it is a synaptic vesicle, as the synaptic vesicle moves towards the plasma membrane, what will happen is the synaptic brevin 2, here in orange, will get incorporated into this complex, so it will wrap its alpha helix, alpha helix into uh, this complex here, and this is known as, this sort of complex here of all four alpha helices, this is known as a core snare complex, and in particular, it's what's known as a trans core snare complex. Okay, and the reason it's called a trans core snare complex, so trans core snare complex, is because all these, well, trans means across on different sides. So uh, it means basically that the snare proteins which are making up the core snare complex are in different membranes. They're across from each other, they're on opposing membranes. So that's as opposed to a cis core snare complex, where all four of these alpha helices will be in the same membrane, and that's what you'll get once this membrane actually fuses with the plasma membrane. Okay, now, you don't just form one of these core snare complexes, instead you form multiple, so let's draw another one down here, just to emphasize this point and make the picture look nicely symmetrical. Okay, so you have these four alpha helices again running parallel with each other and intertwining, okay? So in blue here, we have syntaxin 1. In red, we have SNAP25 here. And then finally, in orange, we have synaptobrevin 2. Okay, and what will happen is uh, these alpha helices will intertwine with each other to form this sort of bundle. And what will happen is as they sort of wind up more and more, what will happen is the plasma membrane and the vesicular membrane will get closer and closer and closer together. Okay, so you might wonder, well, why don't they fuse? What stops them from fusing? Well, that is a question of open research. However, uh, there is a theory... Uh, which I'm going to present to you because it makes a lot of sense. It's a model, and I want to stress that all of science is just models, models for nature. We have models that we believe have more faith in than other models. This is a model that we have less faith in, uh, but it does make sense. So it's a good model. Um, whether it 
is what reality is actually using is a different question and in 20 years time they may well say no this is not what reality is using but I'm going to present this model because it does have some weight behind it a good fraction of the um, people involved in research into this area believe this model so I'm going to present it to you so it's not what's known as the clamp theory okay um, so the clamp theory so the clamp theory is that basically there is like a clamp protein which is stuck in the middle here, okay? And is basically holding these two membranes apart and stopping them from fusing. So this turquoise protein is basically sitting in the middle there and stopping the two membranes from fusing. And the protein that is um, speculated to be this clamp protein is a protein known as complexin. Okay, so this protein complexin is stuck in between the uh, membrane of the vesicle and the mem plasma membrane and is stopping these snare complexes from getting um, as close to each other as they would like to. And basically, if you were to remove this complexin, what would happen is the snare complexes would fuse up more together and they'd pull these membranes together and then they'd fuse. So that is the clamp theory of why these stay docked rather than fusing. So uh, basically this is why you can have lots of uh, synaptic vesicles anchored at the um, at, anchored at the active zone of this presynaptic neuron ready to be released, okay? And these new synaptic vesicles that are docked at the membrane, these are what are known as the readily releasable vesicle pool. So I'll write that up here. So they are the readily releasable vesicle pool. Re realizable? No, releasable vesicle pool. Okay, and they're called that because when an action potential uh, comes along here, these will be the first ones to be released. And they're released, I believe, in something like twen two, sorry, 200 microseconds. Okay, so readily releasable vesicle pool. Right. Okay, so uh, we'll call it there for this video and we'll continue our discussion in the next video.